In this video, we're going to take a look at the future value function uh, in a savings problem. Future value is used to figure out how much money you're going to have at some point in the future. And there are a couple of assumptions that are always made when you use the future value problem or function. And one of those is that uh, you have a constant interest rate and it is compounded at regular intervals. You know, frequently those are monthly intervals, but they don't have to be. Uh, the other assumption that's made is that you add to it the same amount every uh, interest period. Uh, so if it's monthly, then you would be donating or contributing the same amount every single month. Okay, so those are the two assumptions. Uh, if you don't have those two things, then uh, you can't use the future value function. So. Um, we're going to find out how much money we're going to have at some time in the future, and here is a simple problem we're going to start with. Okay, um, you currently have twenty thousand dollars in the bank. Now, when we're doing these financial functions, you see I've got uh, some other ones listed down here. Um, they we have five values that all depend on one another. Uh, the beginning balance, which is called the present value in these problems, uh, the regular deposit, which is called the payment in these problems. Um, the future value, which is what we're trying to compute in this case, um, the total number of periods, and the rate per period. Now, all of these cells here are blank except for row 8, which says compute the number of periods by multiplying, uh, let's double click on this so it'll show us, uh, the periods per year by the years. So let's say the years is 10 and you're doing monthly payments, there'll be 12 periods per year, then this number down here would be 120, which is what you need. And there's a formula down here. Right now it says divide by zero, and this is to find the rate per period. Okay. Well, the rate per period is going to be the annual rate, which is the blue box right here, divided by the periods per year. So let's take an easy example to do in our heads. Let's say the annual rate is 12%. Well, divide that by 12 to get the monthly rate. The monthly rate would be 1%. So what matters in all of these is not the number of years, uh, not the annual rate, but the number of periods and the rate per period. Notice that I have five um, labels here that have an abbreviation in caps. Okay, these are the five cells that all depend on each other. If I know any four of these, I can figure out the fifth one, and that's how all of these functions down here are going to work. We'll be given four of the values, and we're going to have to figure out what the fifth one is. Okay, so let's get started now. You currently have twenty thousand in the bank, and if you currently have 20,000 in the bank, that is your beginning balance, and that is 20,000, and hit enter. And I've already formatted this, by the way, just to make it a little bit easier. Uh, the regular deposit is $100, and it tells us that we're doing this 12 periods per year, so the number 12 is going to go in here. And um, we're going to do this for a long time. We're going to do this for 40 years. So this would be like starting saving in your 20s for retirement in your 60s. Uh, the annual rate is 10%. So I'm going to type in 10.00%. And the ending balance is what we're trying to figure out. So I'm just going to shade that in here with, uh, let's say, gray. And I'm actually going to put the answer over here so it stands out. And you notice that this formula down here multiplies the 12 times the 40 and gives me 480 periods. And this number here takes the 10% and divides it by 12. And so what I get is 5 eighths of a percent. I'm sorry, not 5 eighths of a percent. 5 sixths of a percent. 0.83333 percent. Okay. And then the other thing that matters a little bit uh, is... Are you doing this at the beginning of each month or the end of each month? And uh, you use a numeric code for this. And we're doing it at the beginning of each month. So you put a 1 there if it's the beginning. You put a 0 there if it's the end of the month. So these are the numbers that we need to determine 
how much money we're going to have at the end. Okay? So let's go to our formulas tab, which is where all the functions are. There are a bunch of function groups or categories, and they all have their own little book up here. Uh, we've actually got more than there's room for. So we've got some other options here as well. And uh, everything we're looking at in this video is going to be a financial function. Uh, actually, in this particular video, we're only doing one. And that is the future value function. So click on FV. And Excel does something kind of nice for you here. It brings up this function arguments dialog box. And there's something I want you to notice about the dialog box. Three of the arguments are bold. The other two are not. If an argument name is listed in bold, then it is required. If it is not listed in bold, then Excel uses some uh, sensible default. Okay, So uh, the present value, if we omit that, uh, it's zero. Now we can omit that because it's 20,000 in our case. And the type, if we um, don't put that in, it's going to put a zero, which is the end of the period, but we're doing the beginning of the period, so we're going to have to put that in as well. As a matter of fact, on all of the videos over these um, financial functions, what we're going to do is we are going to put in all five of the arguments. Okay, So let's start off with the rate. And if you read your descriptions down here, it always says the rate per period. Okay, Not the annual rate. Don't pick this number here. Pick the rate per period. I've even labeled it nicely for you. I put the same label on it that we have over here. So that is my rate per period. Number of periods is what's labeled NPER over here, and that's 480. And as you put in the cell references, you'll see that the values appear over here on the right. Uh, the next part, you have to remember something here, and that in every single one of these problems, the payment is always considered a negative number. So we have to put a minus in front of it, and then we can click on the 100 up here in B3. Okay. So why is the payment always negative? Um, the sign on a dollar value has to do with the direction that the money is flowing. And if you imagine this as taking money out of your pocket and taking it to the bank and putting it in the bank, uh, that's considered, even though it's your account, that's considered money going away from you. And money going away from you has a minus sign in front of it. And if you'd like a more detailed explanation than that, uh, ask a business or accounting professor. Okay, the present value. Okay, now this is a little bit tricky too. Uh, present value is 20000 Okay, well, how did that money get there? Well, it got there by me going to the bank and making a bunch of deposits or maybe just one deposit already. And so that is the sum of a bunch of deposits that I've taken to the bank, and they were all going in a negative direction. So the present value in a savings problem is going to be negative as well. And then the last thing down here is the type, and just click on V10, and it's going to tell us right here what our answer is. It also tells us down here in a nicely formatted way. And click on OK, and there is our answer. We will have $1,711,691.29. And here's the kind of cool thing about what we just did. Because we put cell references here in everything, um, we have just solved every single future value problem that you can think of. All you have to do is go here and change the numbers. You want to see what happens if you put in $200 every month instead? Well, that's how much you'll have. Uh, if you change the interest rate to 9% instead of 10%, that's how much money you'll have. Okay. If you change it to 45 years instead of 40, that's how much money you'll have. So uh, we have solved every single problem because we put cell references in here. And we don't have to change this at all. We just have to change the numbers over here and then everything works out okay for us. Uh, one last thing I want to show you on this video is uh, if you realize that you made a mistake in your function arguments, you know, you can go in here and double click and they all come up and you can correct them there. But I think it might be a little easier if you go to this cell, instead of double clicking, go up here to the left of the formula bar and click on the FX. And that will bring up the function arguments dialog box for you. And you can look at each one and, you know, it'd be nice if it lit them up over here, but it does not. Uh, but what is nice is over here, uh, it shows you the value. So if you see some funny looking values over here, then you know that you made a mistake. So when you fix it, you can click on OK and, and you're good.
So that's how the future value function works. Uh, you can solve every single future value problem if you just take this uh, template right here and plug in your specific numbers for a specific problem. And we'll look at some other financial functions in future videos.